just had some lovely surf and I'm going to get changed and go explore the rock pools. You just need to have a piece of paper and a pen ready to mix and notes with. And in this episode of Skull Namara, I'm going to talk to you about an animal that I bet you see more than any other animal on the rocky shore. I wonder if you can guess what animal it is. I'm going to see if I can find some crabs in the rock pools and I'm also going to go to a lovely little cove around the corner and talk to you a little bit about the tides. shore crabs that I found in one of the rock pools. So they're called shore crabs or green shore crabs. You can see the kind of greenish colour that gives them their name. But the scientific name for these guys is Carcinus minus, which I think is kind of a cruel name, Carcinus minus. Um, and the reason animals and different species, the reason different species get these scientific, scientific names is so that no matter where in the world, this species will always be known as Carson and Carsonus minus. It might be known by a different name or in a different language, but the scientific name will always be Carsonus minus. And it's the same for same for other species. They'll all ha always have a special scientific name that stays the same no matter no matter what. And so this species of crab is one that you might come across quite often in the rock pools or on sandy beaches and even in estuaries close to where there's a river flowing in. You'll know that it's a shore crab because you'll see that it's got these five peaky little points along its body either side of its eyes. So it's got five of these kind of peaky ridges along here and in between its eyes it's got three ridges and you'll see its eyes as well are pretty cool the eyes are on these eye stalks and crabs in general can see 360 degrees so they're really really good at picking up changes in in light and seeing things from a, a long way off so if you want to if you want to look at crabs and i remember doing uh, some field work on crabs once and I had to sit really, really still because they'll really notice if they, if they see a shadow moving or if they see any sort of movement, they'll see it really, really quickly. This Carcinus minus, um, this animal is, is a male and I can tell that because it's got this kind of a, a narrow triangular shape on the bottom of its body. A female shore crab um, will have this this sort of flap as well but it'll be kind of rounder and wider and the reason the, the females have a, a wider apron it's called underneath their body is because that's where they store their eggs and the female shore crab might have over 150,000 eggs stored underneath this apron when when she's carrying her eggs you'll notice that crabs uh, they're called dec decapods and that's because they've got 10 legs so five either side and the front claws are counted as as one of their legs so they've one two three four five ten in total and that's similar to other decapods like uh, lobsters and shrimps and prawns they're all they're all called decapods because they have 10 legs crabs are omnivores so that means that they eat both plants and well plants as in seaweed or algae and also animals and crabs are the shore crab is both a predator and a scavenger so it's a predator because it'll eat other live animals and sometimes even eats other carcinus minus so other shore crabs and it's a scavenger because it eats dead material so it'll eat the remains of dead animals or dead algae or seaweed so it's a it's really an omnivore because it just eats anything really and they're important in in the ecosystem because they 
they do a lot of cleaning because they eat some of the dead stuff. Um, it means that they're kind of cleaners. You'll find sometimes the body of a crab on the beach. And you might be, you know, you quite often you could be mistaken for thinking that it's a dead crab, but in actual fact, it's probably the molt of a crab. And you'll be able to tell easily if you lift up the flap at the back of the at the back of the shell, you'll be able to tell if it's a molt because you'll see inside that there's there's no body. It's just an empty shell. Um, there there may be the covering of the gills left behind, but otherwise it's just an empty shell. And the reason for this is because when crabs need to grow, they need to get out of their old shell and make a, a, a new bigger one. The shell of crabs is like their skeleton. So we say that they've got an exoskeleton because the, their skeleton is on the outside. And that means that they can't just keep growing. They need to get out of the exoskeleton and make a new one. And when they do this, They'll, it's almost like they they burst the back of their shell. They'll they'll fill themselves up with water and then they'll burst out through the back of the shell and crawl out the back. And when they molt, first of all, the animal will have a soft shell for a while and it'll take a while for, for that to harden up. So when the crab is just after molting, it's quite vulnerable because it's got this soft shell and it needs to hide out under the rocks. Until its, until its shell hardens. So you will find some of those molts um, on the beach sometimes, and they're not dead crabs, they're actually just the leftover shell from a crab that's after getting bigger and moving to a new, new bigger shell. So I want you to make some notes now to remember some of the facts about, about the shore crab. And the first thing I want you to write is write the name shore crab and draw a line underneath that. And then the next thing I want you to write is to remember that it has 10 legs. So write 10 legs. And the front claw is counted as one of those 10. And then I want you to write omnivore. because they eat both, uh, both other animals and also algae or seaweed and even dead, dead algae and dead animals. And then the last thing I want you to write is exoskeleton. To remember that their skeleton is this, the shell on the outside is actually their skeleton. And remember they need to molt this exoskeleton when they grow bigger and make a new exoskeleton. So now I'm going to put this crab back in the sea, put this Mr. Minus back in the ocean. You'll find lots and lots of these animals on the rocks on the seashore and believe it or not these tiny animals here that are covering the rocks they're related to crabs and lobsters and prawns because they're a type of crustacean. All those types of species are crustaceans. These are barnacles and they're actually really interesting. They don't move off the rock, so they'll find a spot to live on the rock and they'll stay there for their whole lives. When they're really, really tiny, when they're born first, they'll float in the water for a while and they'll feed on microscopic plankton and then they'll find a good spot on the rock where they'll attach for the rest of their lives. And it's really cool, they attach using the antennae in their heads. So they glue themselves or cement themselves really, really strongly onto the, onto the rocks and they spend their whole lives kind of doing a handstand or a headstand on the rocks. And the glue that they produce, scientists think that it's one of the strongest glues produced by any animal. So remember the limpets had really strong teeth, the barnacles have a really strong cement or glue that attaches them to the rock. And like other animals on the rocky seashore, they need to attach really tightly so that the, the tide and the waves don't wash them off the rocks. Barnacles will attach to other things as well. They'll attach to limpets, 
and um, other animals. You sometimes find them on crabs or on bigger whales, quite often have barnacles on them. They just need somewhere hard um, to make their home. And once they've attached with the, this cement or this glue that attaches them to the rock, they'll build this shell around them. And the shell on the top of it, if you look really closely, you'll see that it has almost like doors on it. So when the tide goes out, the barnacle doesn't want to dry out too much. So it'll close the doors. And if you look really closely, you'll see that you can see like a line, like a cross on top of a lot of barnacles because there's sort of four parts to, to the doors on top. So when the tide goes out, they'll trap some water inside, they'll clo close the doors and they'll stay closed whilst they're exposed to the air. Then what they do when they need to feed is when the tide comes in and covers them, they'll open those doors and they've got these kind of feathery feet. So remember, they're kind of doing a headstand on the rock and then they stick their feet out through their body and they use their feet um, to, to take food from the water. So tiny microscopic algae, plankton, and also small little pieces of, of dead uh, algae and animals that are floating in the water. So they are a type of suspension feeder. And it's really interesting when you think of all the different animals on the seashore, um, barnacles are important as suspension feeders because they take some of the dead stuff out of the water. So they're kind of like they're cleaning the water. And you'll have learned other things about the different animals. And it's, I just think it's so amazing the way they all have their little jobs to do. So the barnacle kind of cleans the water. Um, the limpet grazes on the rocks and uh, grazes algae. So imagine if there, if there were no limpets, there'd be too much algae on the rocks and then the barnacles wouldn't have somewhere to attach. Uh, the dog whelk eats the barnacles. Imagine if there were no dog whelks, um, there'd be too many barnacles. So all of the different animals, it's kind of like they have a different job in, in this ecosystem. So all together they make up this beautiful ecosystem. To remember a bit about the barnacles, I want you to write down the word barnacle and you can draw a line underneath that. There are some long words in, in this one so you can pause the video if you need a little bit longer to write. So you have barnacle underlined and the next thing I want you to write is crustacean. So barnacles are a type of crustacean similar to crabs and lobsters and shrimp are also crustaceans. The next thing I want you to write is cement to the rock. So remember that's the way that they attach to the rock and protect themselves from being washed away by the tide or by the water. And then the last thing I want you to write is suspension feeder. Because remember, they have these feathery feet that they stick out of their shell to filter the water. So those are the barnacles, maybe more interesting than they look when you see them first attached to the rocks and probably world record holders for the longest headstand. Right now, it's around the time of low tide. So I'm standing close to the low tide mark. And for the next roughly about six and a quarter hours, the tide will move in towards the high tide mark. So every hour it will move a little bit closer to high tide. And we say that the tide is coming in or that it's flooding. And then at high tide or after high tide, it will take another roughly six and a quarter hours to move back down from high tide back to low tide. And when it does this, we say that the tide is ebbing. So it ebbs from high tide back to low tide, and that takes about six and a quarter hours. So in between low tide, one low tide, and the next low tide, there's about 12 and a half hours. So we say that it's a 12 and a half hour cycle between one low tide and the next low tide. And the same for high tide, between one high tide and the next high tide, is about 12 and a half hours. And this base 
In between the low tide mar mark and the high tide mark is called the intertidal zone. So that's the place where we've been exploring in the Skullnamara videos and where all those interesting and cool and weird and amazing animals live. And that part of the seashore that sometimes is covered in water and sometimes isn't covered in water and it makes the, the animals living there particularly interesting. The tide is caused mostly by the moon. So the moon causes this gravitational pull on the water in the ocean. And so it causes, it's like it causes a bulge. So right now, the moon is pulling on the water around us and it's kind of bulging towards us. And when there's a low tide, it's pulling on a different part of the planet and it drops where we are. So that's why it keeps happening just over and over again, caused, caused by the moon. <laughs> At different times of the month, depending on whether it's a new moon or a half moon or a full moon, the tide can be different so during a new moon and a full moon it's called a spring tide and during a spring tide the distance between the high tide mark and the low tide mark is the biggest so the tide moves a big distance during a spring tide the other times of month when there's a half moon the tide doesn't move so much it goes from low tide to high tide and it's not as big a distance and that's called a neat tide so you have spring tides and neap tides depending on the phase of the moon. You need to be really careful with the tides. I've mentioned this before. But just to remember that like what's happening now, when the tide is coming in, it's going to start covering some of the rocks that were out in, out in the open or out in the air earlier. So you've got to be really careful when the tide turns and starts to come in or starts to flood. You've got to be careful to get off the rocks so that you don't get stuck out there or don't get really wet. <laughs> so to remind you a bit and to help you to remember a bit about the tides, I want you to make some notes in your copybook. The first thing I want you to write down is the word tides and underline that because that's the title. So we have tides. The next thing I want you to write is 12 and a half hour cycle. And you can pause the video if you need a bit of time to write that. So the 12 and a half hour cycle is between one low tide and the next low tide. So it takes about six and a quarter hours to get to high tide and then six and a quarter hours to go back out to low tide. The next thing I want you to write is caused by the moon because the moon is the, the main thing that influences the tides by causing this gravitational pull that pulls on the water and causes the tides to happen. And then the last thing I want you to write is intertidal zone. So that's the space on the seashore that we've been exploring between the high tide mark and the low tide mark. Sometimes it's covered with water and sometimes it's out in the air. So the next time somebody asks you what your favorite place is, maybe don't say that it's the beach, tell them that's the intertidal zone and they'll be really impressed. So I've got an exercise for you to do and I think you're really gonna like this one because I want you to make up some rules for grown-ups. So what I want you to do is think of some rules to tell grown-ups what they need to do to protect the ocean. And try and think of at least three rules, but you can do more if you want. And remember some of the facts that you've learned about in the Skullnamara videos and include some words like biodiversity or some other words that you've learned during the videos. You can email me your rules. Um, either put them in an email or take a photo of them and send them to skullnamara at gmail.com and I love pictures if you have any pictures to go along with the rules as well. To stay up to date with the Skullnamara videos follow Skullnamara on Facebook or YouTube and you'll get updates on when the latest videos are online. When you get to go explore the seashore yourself, there are a few things that are really important to remember. The first thing is always go with an adult. The second thing 
check the tide times before you go. So the best time to go rock pooling or exploring the seashore is before the time of low tide. And you've got to be really careful when the water starts to come back in when it's moving towards high tide because it'll cover the rocks and you really, really don't want to get stuck on the rocks. The third thing to remember is to wear shoes that are uh, secure and that have good grip on the rocks. I like to wear a pair of old runners, they're perfect. And wellies can be good as well sometimes. And then the final thing is always leave no trace. So what I mean by that is when I go to the beach or the seashore or anywhere in nature or in the countryside, I don't leave anything behind me. I make sure to bring everything home with me. Um, I don't bring any animals or shells because the seashore is where they belong. So remember always in the countryside, at the beach, wherever you are, leave no trace.